Hi, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, I think we're going to just start in the interest of time. If I could have everyone to quiet down just a tad bit so we can start the meeting. Thank you very much. Uh, I know sandwiches are exciting, but I think what you're going to hear from our fantastic panelists is going to be even more exciting. And thank you also for everyone for joining, us, joining online. us online. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Sorry, we see uh, a that is... small sound issue in the room. OK, it's fixed. All right, so good afternoon and hello to all of us joining you today, uh, joining us here today, um, both in the room, but also online. Uh, my name is Juliana Helu Vandenberg. I'm a political affairs officer with UNODA, so the United Nations Office for Disarmament Affairs in Geneva. And I'm also a member of the CCW Implementation Support Unit. And the outset, I also quickly want to introduce my colleague, Dong Yung Cho, who is a senior researcher on the security and technology program at the United Nations Institute for Disarmament Research, more known as UNIDIR. And she'll be, uh, she'll be joining here on, the, on this little mini podium a little bit later on to moderate our discussion. Um, I'd first like to th start thanking all of the participating um, people here today and our panelists um, to, uh, to explore the, this important topic, exploring directed energy weapons and the implications of their use under international law, which has been co-organized co by UNIDA and UNIDA. And UNIDA. And UNIDA. Um, um, sorry, we're facing again a couple of sound issues, uh, which means there's an echo, so if you hear me hesitate, it's to avoid the echo. Um, the project is uh, supported by, the, um, by a project funded by the European Union on uh, supporting the implementation and promoting the universalization of the CCW. So since its entry into force, the CCW, or the Convention on Certain Conventional Weapons, um, high contracting parties have continuously discussed emerging technologies. And in some instances, they've also adopted protocols on specific conventional weapons issues that they had identified um, as particularly in need of regulation. One such emerging technology includes directed energy weapons, which, as will be discussed by our panelists today, uh, may be deemed to fall under the scope of the CCW, and as such deserves closer and renewed scrutiny in the context of the Convention. So today's panel discussion will introduce you to directed energy weapons and the challenges they give rise to, and is structured into three parts. First, an overview of the technology behind directed energy weapons and their impact on international security. The second is the relationship between directed energy weapons and general principles of international humanitarian law. And third and final, the legal challenges that arise in the relation to directed energy weapons and matters of regulation. Each speaker will deliver a presentation and we will then open the floor for a Q&A after the last presentation, which will be moderated by Dong Yung. Uh, if you would like to take the floor after the panel presentation, please raise your hand if you're in the room and we'll give you the floor and a microphone. For those of us joining us online, please wait for us to call on you to unmute your microphone. Alternatively, please feel free to type your questions into the Q&A tab throughout the panel discussion. Please make your questions as specific and clear as possible and indicate to which panelist the question is addressed. And to avoid duplicating channels of communications, we have disabled the chat functions for all participants. If you have any questions, comments or requests for the organizers, including any technical ones, please type them into the Q&A and we'll take care of it as we'll monitor this Q&A throughout the entire panel discussion. So without further ado, let me introduce our first speaker, which is Dr. Jürgen Altmann. Dr. Altmann is a physicist specializing in the assessment of new military technologies and preventative arms control. He's a former researcher and lecturer in the Department of Physics at TU Dortmund University in Germany. And his presentation will focus on the technology behind directed energy weapons and their impact on international security. Dr. Altman, uh, over to you, and please do share your screen for the presentation. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, good afternoon. I hope I'm being heard correctly. Is that true? And do you see my presentation? 
Yes, we can hear you loud and clear and we see your presentation. Thank Very you. good. OK, I'm, I thank the organizers for inviting me. Uh, I'll tell you about four in four different sections, a little bit what are directed energy weapons, then focusing on two specific types, namely laser weapons on the one hand and microwave weapons on the other, and then end with a summary. If someone needs more information, there are a couple of publications uh, among them from me, myself that you could look at. First, what are directed energy weapons? So these are weapons that damage or destroy a target by projecting energy without macroscopic material objects, no gun, no artillery shells, whatever. Uh, they can either use electromagnetic waves, in particular in the light region of frequencies and wavelengths, so this would be laser, wave, laser weapons, and at somewhat longer wavelengths, microwaves. I'll come to these uh, later. Uh, there's also the principal possibility of particle beam weapons, so where electrons, protons, and atoms would be projected towards some target, but since they will certainly not arrive in the near and also not in the, in the immediate future, I will no longer talk about these today. <clears throat> and just to have mentioned them, I will not discuss acoustic weapons, which could in some sense also come under the heading of directed energy. So how do these directed energy weapons do damage to targets? They can have effects on sensors or electronics. They can do actual physical heating and then melting or even vaporization of materials. They can project a mechanical impulse and they can have secondary effects. So for instance, ignition of explosive that is hidden in some uh, material target. The damage could be temporary or permanent, and it ranges from disabling for some time maybe, to via deflecting an object, flying object maybe, and changing its directory to actually destroy it, or in case of human targets, hurting or killing a person. Coming to laser weapons. LASER is an acronym, an abbreviation for light amplification by stimulated emission of radiation. So here, the principle is explained in a very short sketch. One photon comes from the left and meets some molecular or atomic system that is excited and which is then stimulated to send another photon along while losing its internal energy. And if you do this between two mirrors, there will be an avalanche effect and a very strong light intensity bouncing to and fro between those mirrors. And if one of these mirrors is partially reflective only, part of that goes out of laser beam. And the beam is relatively narrow, just uh, as uh, following from the properties of these mirrors. The laser was invented in 1960, and today we have three fundamental types of lasing material, solid ones, liquid ones, or gases ones. And the excitation can come by light, by electric current, or a chemical reaction. And the wavelengths that can be produced range from the infrared via the visible region uh, to ultraviolet and even X-ray um, wavelengths. The average power depends on the size, etc. So we can have laser pointers of milliwatts uh, up to very big systems that project uh, a million of watts, megawatts. And uh, in civilian industry uses, lasers are being used to process material. Uh, their power is in the range of several kilowatts. For comparison, an electrical cooking plate has about two kilowatts and a microwave oven maybe one. Uh, what are these damaging effects in a little more in detail? Uh, heating, which can lead to a melting of material, vaporization, or as I said, ignition of fuel or explosive, that requires a continuous power on the order of tens of kilowatts to megawatts dwelling on the same spot for seconds, or uh, creating a mechanical impulse by fast ablation of the uppermost layer of some object. Uh, this requires intense short pulses. 
Laser beams and their propagation have several properties that are relevant technically. So on the one hand, there is much input energy needed. The efficiency from primary energy to light or laser output is several percent to maybe tens of percent. As I said, these wavelengths can be very small and because of large optics that could be used, there is little beam widening with distance. The effect propagates very fast with the speed of light, so no lead in front of the target uh, for the travel time is really required. Um, a straight line from the weapon to the uh, object to the target is needed, so you need a free line of sight. You can't shoot over the hill, so to speak. And there are several atmospheric effects, not in outer space, but in the atmosphere. So light can be absorbed and scattered out of the beam by several atmospheric phenomena. Uh, there is an effect like thermal blooming when the uh, air in the beam is heated so much that the beam is being uh, distorted by that. And there can also be plasma formation. What are the military advantages and disadvantages of laser weapons? As I said, the beam propagates with the speed of light, so no leading is necessary. But if you need to dwell several seconds on an object or tens of seconds even, you have to follow the motion of that object. There is a line of sight needed, as said. So in many cases, you can notice the effect that you have on the target, but not in all cases. And of course, the transmitter by the line of sight exposes itself. No actual munition is needed, but energy supply in the form of chemicals or electricity and in particular on small uh, carrier vehicles, aircraft, etc. The supply may be limited. It may be that the cost per shot in quotes is low. Uh, as said, several atmospheric effects hamper the propagation of the beam and the focusing on a narrow spot. The, I said that the laser was invented in 1960 and exactly then already its first research for use in laser weapons started. It got a big push with the US SDI in the 80s where megawatt chemical lasers were conceived on satellites or were even built as in prototypes on big aircraft for ballistic missile defense. Such projects have all been abandoned. There is a present trend towards from chemical to electric supply, uh, combining, for instance, so-called fiber lasers as they are being used in industry uh, and enlarge the power to a few hundred kilowatts. A couple of prototypes uh, that have been uh, the, the one on the left, uh, upper left, even permanently deployed on a US ship, but just one copy and uh, several other prototypes uh, having been developed and are being tested uh, in Russia, Israel and China. But as I said, it's just prototypes. What are the potential targets of laser weapons? Human eyes. However, due to the protocol 4 in, in the CCW, uh, laser weapons for permanent blinding of people are prohibited, so they can only be used for dazzling. They could uh, target sensors, in particular also on board satellites in a couple of hundred kilometers altitude. Uh, there is the possibility of igniting improvised explosive devices over a few meters or uh, maybe 10, 10 or 20 meters. It could be, uh, sorry, small UAVs or big UAVs, swarms of them or aircraft and small boats. And short-range rockets, artillery, and anti-ship missiles. Demonstrated in exercises and experiments and tests have been shooting down of small UAVs and satellite sensors temporarily blinded. Somebody who sees himself as a potential target of a laser weapon can apply several types of countermeasures, do some shielding, maybe build up a smoke screen, apply some absorptive or reflective coating to the potential target or rotate it or maneuver uh, rapidly to evade the following with the beam. So summarizing on laser weapons, 
I would say, after six decades of research and development and abandonment of several megawatt class projects with chemical lasers, laser weapons with electric excitation and tens of kilowatts to 100 kilowatts are beginning to be deployed. With their energy supply, these are relatively big and need a truck or container or are based on a ship. While taking down soft, small targets has been demonstrated, the effect against larger or harder targets in realistic conditions is still under investigation. Fog, clouds or dust can severely reduce the effect. Blinding optical sensors temporarily or permanently needs comparatively little power down to tens of watts or even watts. Research in this whole area is continuing not only for higher laser powers, but also for new ideas. This was the laser weapons part, and now I go to the micro weapons section. Microwaves are also electromagnetic waves, but they have much longer wavelengths than the laser lights usually being deployed or employed. Uh, so the beam angle is much wider. There's much wider distribution of beam energy over an increasing area with distance, so they usually have shorter range. There are two general types, narrow band emission with continuous wave emission with a power of maybe up to 100 kilowatts beaming over seconds, or using wide or ultra wide band waves with a peak power up to 100 megawatts or even beyond, however, in very short pulses that are on the order of microseconds and below. So a couple of hundred pulses per second can only be uh, emitted. So the uh, average power is rather in the order of watts or up to a kilowatt. Uh, what are the damaging functions of microwave microwaves? They can enter electronics through slits in the outer houses of systems or through antennas that are usually used, of course, on such uh, whatever tanks, ships, uh, aircraft, inducing currents there and burning microelectronic com components or wires inside the circuits. Or they heat up water containing material, for instance, in human skin. The range of microwave weapons is from dozens of meters via hundreds of meters to at maximum kilometers for very strong and reasonably uh, focused microwave beams. There is a sliding transition from what one uses as el usual electronic warfare interfere with some electronic transmission via disruption and damage and up to even destroy internal electronics. So there are two types of carriers either by small vehicles or even fixed pods, as you see here, with the applications to stop vehicles or take down small UAVs or small guided missiles by destroying their or interfering with their control uh, receivers. Or they are being carried on trucks or cruise missiles where again, the applications might be to stop UAVs, but all, or even swarms of them, or shut off electronic systems on the ground. Uh, and also there has been the concept of influencing crowds by creating heat pain on the outer skin, but these systems have not yet been deployed. So summarizing on microwave weapons, I would say, after several decades of research and development, various prototypes have been built and demonstrated. Microwave weapons are beginning to be deployed, often in a police context. Civilian systems that could be the targets are hardened much less than military ones. First military systems exist on missiles and cruise missiles. Some systems are relatively big and need a truck or container. A system for skin heating has been developed but not deployed and research and development are continuing. Slow expansion can be expected. So all in all, uh, summarizing on these types, I would say that laser weapons have been discussed and conceived of for ballistic missile defense and anti-satellite use. These will not appear in the near or medium future. The use in the atmosphere over kilometers range is arriving but beam propagation occur 
in unfavorable conditions. Concerning microwave weapons, the idea is to shut off electronics, for instance, in cars over dozens of meters. Uh, military systems can affect targets in hundreds of meters to maybe kilometers to be transported on trucks or missiles. And research is continuing in all these areas. So uh, this was the overview about the technology. I thank you for attention and look forward to what the international law colleagues have to say. Thank you for your attention. <clears throat> thank you very much, Dr. Altman, for this very in-depth presentation on the technologies and the various types of, of weapons, which was very interesting. If you could stop sharing your screen, so then we have the others uh, on the screen once they start speaking, and we'll come back to you with plenty of questions, I'm sure, at a later uh, stage. So our next panelist is Dr. Lauren Sanders, who is going to be with us in the room today. Dr. Sanders is a senior research fellow with the Law and Future of War project at the TC Barron School of Law with the University of Queensland in Australia. Her presentation will focus on the relationship between directed energy weapons and general principles of international humanitarian law. The floor is all yours. Thank you very much for that introduction and hopefully my presentation is more exciting than Sam um, so, uh, Thanks very much for having me here today and thank you uh, Jürgen for ably, ably outlining the details of the technology um, and Stuart will follow in relation to some of the issues that will come up from my presentation in terms of how these technologies affect humans. But my focus is really going to be on the anti-material use of directed energy weapons um, <clears throat> and in particular dealing with the issue of um, proportionality and indiscriminacy of those those weapons. Before we begin, though, I think it's useful, um, given this information that exists in relation to the use of directed energy weapons, to talk about some of the legal basics in terms of their categorization. Um, so first and foremost, yes, they are weapons. There have been some analyses that have suggested because there isn't a direct munition or kinetic effect between the weapon that they might not be considered as such but they are intended to cause a harm, even though that kinetic effect is a secondary um, consequence of the use of energy to, um, to uh, use of thermal light and energy to cause those damage effects. Um, and the consequent blast fragmentation and additional heat damage arising from that in initial interaction um, when that directed energy is targeted towards a particular material does make them a weapon. So that doesn't cause any problems in relation to how we apply existing rules of international law or international humanitarian law in relation to these weapons, because the harm specifically intended is an outcome of the use of the weapon. It's direct, albeit secondary in the chain of causation. And even though there's no physical strike, the application of, uh, of heat, that is energy, doesn't alter the conduct of hostilities rules as they might apply to the use of direct energy weapons. And the rules of attack themselves are, are drafted in terms of acts of violence against an enemy that don't specify that there needs to be a specific munition that causes that harm. Second, because they're not weapons of mass destruction, they fall in the category of conventional weapons. Whilst not traditional weapons, they are conventional from a legal classification sense. And accordingly, the terms of the Convention on Certain Conventional Weapons could be used as a method to regulate them, should that be um, something that states party agree or consider necessary in the future. Third, in terms of applicability of existing laws, as the CCW does apply, Protocol 4 and its impact on humans will be discussed in detail by Stuart, but it's relevant to note for the purposes of, of what I'm going to talk about in terms of anti-material use, that Protocol 4 is expressly excised as a consequence of Article 3 of that protocol in terms of incidental or collateral effects of direct energy weapons as they might cause blindness to humans. Fourth, the provisions of Protocol 3 concerning incendiary weapons also do not apply to directed energy weapons. Some direct energy weapons can utilize chemical reactions to cause the heat and to cause the energy to then be um, to be uh, used to then uh, strike the target to to make uh, to destroy it. But this isn't done as a result of a chemical re chemical reaction occurring because of a substance delivered on the intended target, which is the key difference in relation to the uh, the definitions of what requires um, what amounts to an incendiary weapon. 
So thus, absent any specific prohibition under international law, the general rules of IHL apply, and in particular, the, con the rules of uh, conduct of hostilities, uh, uh, other principal legal considerations in the use of these kinds of weapons. So turning now to anti-material uses in particular, this is the most likely deployed utility for these weapons, with a number of states already testing, as we've heard, the use of directed energy weapons, particularly in counter UAS or counter drone uh, capabilities, and focusing also for the future on the use of directed energy weapons as missile defence capabilities, citing speed, accuracy, those other technical um, requirements that we've heard from Jürgen today as key benefits of such a system. In the case of Australia, which I'm more familiar with in terms of strategic plans for weapons and capabilities, there have been talk about use of these weapons as anti-tank weapons, for example. So there are considerations in relation to how these weapons can be further developed to be used more broadly. Um, and really the use of lasers, because they deliver their effects at the speed of light, also uh, are an attractive capability to utilise as part of layered counter hypersonic capabilities. Um, although there are technical channel challenges in terms of target acquisition and tracking in relation to their use, with multiple states like the US announcing that they're focusing research and development on those kinds of uses. Of course, in terms of anti-material use, the predicted utility of this capability into the far future, as we've heard, is that of anti-satellite lasers, which would then require some consideration about the modality of their use when we're talking about responsible behaviours in space. Um, I'm not intending to discuss militarisation of space or associated issues with those today, um, which cuts out any obvious reference to Star Wars, um, but focusing instead on anti-material roles, not necessarily just the complete destruction of the capability. As we've heard already, the intention can be from a dis disruptive effect, a denial effect, or a complete destruction effect all of which has a different implication for how long the weapon might need to be trained on the particular object it's intending to affect. And that takes that strike period from milliseconds to tens of seconds, as, as Jürgen has already, already mentioned. So currently, some of the technological challenges in the deployment in the anti-material role really relate to consistency in relation to a stable energy, energy source, rather than necessarily the apparatus to deliver the directed energy effect itself. And although there's some, and there's some legal considerations that uh, that fall out as a consequence of considering the control devices necessary for these weapons as a result of that that issue. So in terms of identifying and striking the target, the laser itself can't be used as the target target identifier. Lasers have been used for decades for the purposes of optical identification of targets, but the laser directed energy weapon itself, obviously, if it's trained on an object, is going to cause damage to it. So there are secondary optical um, sensor requirements needing to be attached to the system for a directed energy weapon. The cheap versions of these typically focus just on optical, uh, optical sensors where lasers could also be used of less power to conduct uh, sensor uh, identification. Notably, in the case of most counter UAS drones, the spectrum that is used, so the light that is used or the energy that is used, is actually visible to the human eye when it's actually trained on those drones to, to strike them and cause destruction, which has some implications in relation to issues of distinction, which we'll talk about now. Um, and the mechanisms to create the level of energy are different, and some novel technologies like hydrogen energy are being tested. There's currently a project underway in Australia using a hydrogen energy um, uh, generator to allow for these capabilities to be deployed on small, uh, small movable objects, i.e. trucks, to be able to use these in, in counter drone, uh, practically use these and deploy these in counter drone capabilities. So taking all that information into account, thinking about the principle of distinction, to assess if a directed energy weapon, and, and I'm focused largely on lasers being used for counter drone, um, uh, for counter drone capabilities for, for this example, for it to be lawfully deployed, the issue rests on the ability of this particular capability to distinguish its uh, effects when deployed between military and civilian objects. That is, can it reliably hit the target it's intended to strike? And this is actually one of the most cited benefits of this kind of weapon is that it's incredibly precise in terms of hitting the thing that it is pointed at. It's a direct line of sight, it's point to point, it goes over a straight line, subject to those technical issues that Jürgen mentioned in terms of environmental um, uh, impact. Uh, 
The microwave lasers, sorry, the micro microwave energy weapons, on the other hand, are less specific because they're likely to be used over a broader spectrum. Whereas the, the lasers themselves, laser weapons are more focused. And indeed, most of the challenges in deploying these technologies are focusing on trying to keep the beams um, narrow so that they can extend the range of the laser weapons. So for the development of counter UAS laser technology, the limitations in relation to how far the beam can be focused over the intended distance at the minimum um, energy level don't actually allow for the lasers to be dialed up or dialed down according to the object they're intending to strike. So what this means is that the laser itself is being shot in the counter drone context uh, at a preset distance based on an assessment of what mo most drones are made out of, i.e. carbon fibre. So in that sense, if something is hit at a, a lower distance, the impact on that object is not necessarily calculated as part or calibrated as part of the laser use, or if something is beyond the range of the laser, uh, the impact of the directed energy isn't uh, also going to be predicted in a, uh, a precise way because the impacts of the environment, blooming and those other technical issues might also impact how that laser can travel that extra distance. So in relation to that distinction aspect, because they are capable of, uh, of direct point to point access, really it's a case of understanding the limitations of the laser technology that has been created to know whether or not something is being struck is within the realms of what it's been calculated to be capable of doing, i.e. carbon fibre drone within a range of 100 to 150 metres, it's going to cause a destructive effect. Outside of that, we don't know if it's going to cause a blooming effect or be, uh, closer than that effect, we don't know exactly how big the blast radius of that, the, of that laser against um, destroying that particular object might be. Equally, if the drone is made out of a different kind of, com uh, of, of material, a different composite material, for example, the time required to actually strike that object or to cause the destructive effect of that object also might not be known. So it might need to be exposed for more than just a few milliseconds, which has implications in relation to how long the laser needs to be turned on for, and then potentially increases the risk of uh, collateral objects passing through the laser's beam during that period. When we're considering that though, in comparison to conventional weapons, the timing is a matter of milliseconds and a very limited time window um, compared to conventional weapons um, traveling, uh, traveling through uh, through the air. So it's not a significantly different um, time period. In relation to incidental harm caused by other targets getting in between the laser and the intended target, it's potentially less than traditional weapons on the basis that lasers travel at the speed of light. So it's really a matter of uh, assessing the required time to cause the destructive effect. Uh, and in many cases, that will be less than the travel time of the munition to get to the particular object if we're talking about longer distances. Um, there are two technical issues that also minimise potential harm in case of overshot. So in the second issue, if, if a, a laser is intending to strike a target that might miss and uh, therefore shoots off into the distance beyond the target, um, there are the issue of blooming, which we've heard previously, which is effectively where the laser will dissipate into the environment and won't be able, capable of causing harm. And then the second issue is the capacity to continue that focused laser beam over a distance as well. So from that perspective, there is minimal risk from a distinction perspective or an incidental collateral harm perspective that if the laser doesn't strike what it's intended to strike at its predicted distance, that it might cause other effects. From a blinding perspective, um, the risk of causing uh, optical, um, optical damage to a, a pilot, for example, in a plane, if uh, it was passing by uh, where a drone has in, was intended to be struck, is also such a distance that it's unlikely to cause harm to that pilot's eye, regardless of whether they have optical sensors or not. Um, so from that perspective, there's, there's pretty low risks in relation to the use of directed energy weapons for counter UAS if we're talking lasers. That said, the bigger issue is in relation to those environmental um, impacts that Jürgen has mentioned. So the capacity of the beam to remain unaltered by the surrounding environment, um, environmental conditions that do impact its accuracy. So these impacts will change on a day-to-day -day basis, as does the weather um, and the deployment location as well, because depending on where the, um, the laser is deployed, things like altitude, things like uh, relative humidity impact the reliability of that laser to perform in the way that it was tested. Um, most designers, in fact, uh, talk about reliability of these kinds of weapon systems based on testing in a clear day, if they've actually done field testing itself. 
Many of these capabilities are tested in lab laboratory environments because of some of the difficulties in finding ranges that will allow for testing of lasers, in which case they're tested over very small distances and then using principles of physics extrapolated as to how they might perform in the environment. Obviously, that causes um, concerns in relation to um, ascertaining the reliability of these weapons in day to day or actual use in a, in a real, in a real life complex environment. Um, outcome of some of these technical challenges um, and the potential for unintended secondary effects also require careful consideration in relation to the control device that is attached to the laser itself. It also necessitates that the operators, these capabilities are trained to understand the effects of the weapons. And if some of these environmental factors or other factors is going to change the expected um, reliability or functioning of the weapon that they have. And effectively requires a broad testing regime to be able to certify if a weapon is capable of being used in these additional environmental considerations to um, ascertain if there has been a degradation of performance. Turning to the issue of proportionality then, um, the critical issue in this instance is the ability to act accurately predict the impact of any potential damage caused by the direct energy weapon. So in terms of incidental or collateral damage, the main issue is not incidental harm that's likely to occur. As mentioned, the laser is a direct point-to-point -point weapon, and in this regard, it's more accurate um, than the less predictable arc of many conventional munitions, other conventional munitions. Um, the issue relates to the secondary of the effect of the laser if its intended target has deployed countermeasures. So, as has also been mentioned in terms of the technology, very cheap and effective countermeasures relate to putting a reflective surface on, on drones, for example, which we're seeing in the design and development of, very, uh, of many small drones these days. Um, unless the laser hits at an exactly perpendicular angle, then the laser will bounce off at an unintended or an unknown angle from the operator's perspective at relatively identical intensity levels and then having a potential or a capacity to cause significant incidental harm to civilian objects or, uh, or humans who are in vicinity of wherever that beam might bounce. This likely collateral harm must be then assessed as part of the calculus in deploying the weapon, unless of course the risk can be mitigated. So in this case, if knowledge of this effect was reasonably known at the time of deploying the weapon, it's something that the person deploying the weapon must legally take into account before employing it. So if indirect effects are a genuine concern, then we must also assess whether the weapons should be controlled to prevent these effects, even if only secondary to their use as anti-material weapons. For most weapons that have been subject to ordinary testing and evaluation procedures, this isn't likely to be a significant consideration as those effects can be measured. But if you compound this with the environmental instability of direct um, energy weapons and lasers, as mentioned earlier, current testing methods also being typically conducted in laboratories, predictions about their functionality being extrapolations of physical calculations, um, it's not clear if the, if the systems as currently planned or deployed um, are capable of being predicted to a sufficient level of accuracy. Finally, separate to these basic issues of distinction and proportionality, there are a couple of general legal implications that require some additional thought for these kinds of weapons. First, the effect of the discharge of this kind of energy into the environment is not completely known. Lasers ionize the atmosphere and, from, and form radicals that can lead to formation of byproducts, um, the full effect of which we don't yet know about. Use of high powered lasers in laboratory environments come with protocols and warnings that the use of directed energy or intense energy on microorganisms might cause those micro microorganisms to be resistant to penicillin, for example. Doing that in an uncontrolled environment obviously has some concerns in terms of the potential harm that might be caused to the natural environment. Accordingly, if a state is intending to field a directed energy weapon or a laser, they'd need to determine if they have sufficient information to be satisfied that it would not cause widespread long-term and severe damage to the natural environment and thus be pro uh, prohibited by uh, national humanitarian law. Second, the effect of this weapon in less than lethal doses upon the human body is not clear and whether their use in any do dose results in superfluous injury or unnecessary suffering is a live issue and one that si um, Stuart's going to be uh, addressing in, in his presentation. As it stands, the use of directed energy weapons in anti-material anti functions show potential to create a more accurate weapon. However, I think that we need more information in relation to some of their, um, yeah, some of their uh, 
some predictability in terms of the use of that weapon um, and their environmental impact before we can uh, definitely ascertain that their use is lawful under existing rules of international humanitarian law. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Dr. Sanders, for um, your presentation. I was chasing down this. This is a fairly loud room, uh, so to make sure that there's not people chatting in the background. So um, with that, and all questions are going to be brought to you at a later stage, I want to introduce our last panelist of the day. Um, Dr. Stuart Casey Mazon is an associate fellow with the Global Fellowship Initiative of the Geneva Center for Security Policy and an honorary professor at the University of Pretoria in South Africa. His presentation will focus on the legal challenges that arise in relation to directed energy weapons and how they may be regulated. Dr. Casey Maslin, you have the floor. Thanks very much and good afternoon. Um, Despite its long-standing nature as a rule of the law of armed conflict, the law of war, as it was then, uh, I would suggest to you that superfluous injury or unnecessary suffering is both subject to misinterpretation, um, but is also subject to a lack of clarity in its interpretation. And I think both of those problems uh, persist uh, to this day. The rule itself, as you know, uh, first enunciated in 1899, um, but I think we need, uh, as we will in a minute, to go back to the St. Petersburg Declaration to get the, the basis uh, uh, behind this uh, rule. What uh, is also Im important to, stay, uh, to say is that uh, Lauren focused on the, uh, the notion of uh, distinction and uh, protection of civilians. Of course, the superfluous injury rule is more focused on the protection of combatants or uh, fighters. I'd like to read a, a short uh, extract from an online article that was posted in 2018 uh, by a graduate of the US Air Force uh, Academy. If the law of armed conflict is adjusted to permit directed energy weapons, which could minimize suffering to the most extent possible, using aerial lasers with the power to target personnel on the ground can redefine the way the US Air Force uses air power. He goes on, experts suggest that an anti-personnel laser must direct several megawatts of energy at a soldier to burn him. For the US military, and here's the rub, for the US military uh, to lawfully use directed energy weapons against combatants would require the laser to generate even more lethal energy, enabling an instant incineration that does not cause superfluous injury. Now, uh, 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 the lawyers amongst you will, uh, I hope, be cringing at this. It clearly does not reflect uh, US uh, policy. I'm not for a moment uh, suggesting that it does. But the fact that this is only five years ago that this was uh, put up by uh, an uh, experienced individual from a respected institution, I think, shows us that we do, uh, we do have uh, a challenge. So as I said, let's go back very briefly to St. Petersburg uh, and 1868. And the words that they used there, you can take out some words to uh, form the basis of the principle of distinction, but you can also, I think, use uh, some of the words to construct the fundament of the superfluous injury rule. It is sufficient to disable the greatest number of men, by which they meant uh, render or the combat, but not to use arms that needlessly aggravate suffering or render death inevitable. And I think those two elements of needlessly aggravating suffering or rendering death inevitable are what should, should form the basis uh, for this. But then we also get into a linguistic uh, debate. As many of you will know, the wording in the English version of the Hague Regulations differs. Um, and I would say that it is not just a semantic uh, difference. Remembering that the authentic language, the, the language of negotiation uh, was French, the words used are pop-a. Um, what I would suggest is best translated as 
of a nature too. It is an objective standard, not an, uh, a subjective uh, standard. But uh, a, a leading um, US lawyer of the time, uh, Richard Baxter, um, decided that actually the best translation was the one uh, that uh, the US uses, which is calculated to. Now that is clearly a very different standard when you're talking about something that you are assessing, whether it is likely to do it based on its ordinary expected uh, use, or whether there is some kind of malign weapon designer intent uh, behind it. Luckily, uh, the 1977 Additional Protocol 1 and customary international law, at least the uh, ICRC's Rule 70, uses the more objective and I think the more correct standard of a nature uh, to cause superfluous injury or, or unnecessary suffering. And uh, uh, the US Air Force uh, a pamphlet on uh, the law of armed conflict talks about the prohibition including, uh, including weapons that render death inevitable. And we're talking, of course, about anti-personnel uh, weapons here that are directed towards uh, enemy soldiers. And they give examples of poison, uh, chemical warfare, and even uh, perhaps surprisingly expanding ammunition. And that leads me to my uh, second point, the, the lack of clarity. Uh, those of you uh, with long memories uh, will uh, remember the project by the International Committee of the Red Cross in the 1990s, the so-called Cyrus uh, project, which was unfortunately uh, abandoned. Uh, I think there were uh, some very important elements in that, and I hope that the ICRC or another uh, suitable institution will take this up because we need a little bit more clarity in how to assess when we're looking at a weapon system, whether it's directed energies, uh, weapons, or anything else, we need a little bit more clarity on what the criteria are. Now, as both uh, Jürgen and Lauren have mentioned, we have, of course, got Protocol 4. That is addresses an anti-personnel directed uh, energy weapon and um, there's a good level of adherence, 110 states parties, but that's a long way from universality and it even doesn't uh, encompass all of the uh, states parties to the uh, Convention on Conventional Weapons itself. The first article talks about weapons specially designed to cause permanent blindness to unenhanced uh, vision and, uh, uh, and it was an innovation at the time, the prohibition on transfer. Again, those of you along with long memories will remember what a challenge it was, what a challenge it was to get that prohibition on transfer in an IHL, in a law of armed conflict uh, instrument. But I think that was a positive uh, development. And uh, likewise, as Lauren has just mentioned, there is this exclusion of in incidental blindness from lawful use of military systems. So we have a robust uh, uh, protocol that is customary uh, law, the uh, prohibition on using uh, specially uh, designed uh, blinding uh, laser weapons. Whether or not blinding as a method of warfare is, as you know, a little bit more contested in particular uh, by the United States. And then uh, we have, uh, and again, uh, um, uh, Jürgen mentioned uh, in passing, the active denial system, which has been developed partially for law enforcement, partially uh, for uh, warfare. Um, this is a millimeter wave uh, weapon uh, that uses energy to penetrate 1 64th of an inch into the skin, causing a rapid and intense heating sensation. Um, the large ADS can uh, uh, fire for uh, one uh, kilometer, a 1.5 uh, meter wide beam, so clearly uh, covering uh, a person, and the effect is like being cooked in a microwave oven. Uh, the report is that uh, for most people, three seconds is unbearable, for everyone, five seconds is unbearable. And despite the uh, manufacturer's reassurances, second degree burns are possible. Um, the problem, of course, is if you use that weapon in riot control or if you use that in a prisoner of, uh, of war camp, you have to be able to get out of the way. And if you're in a confined space or if you're uh, with other people, you may not be able to escape uh, the pain. There is also a smaller version of the ADS, uh, which was being deployed to 
uh, a prison in, I think, the state of Georgia in uh, the United States called the Silent Guardian. That has a much uh, shorter uh, range, 250 yards. But I think it's clear that in law enforcement, these weapons simply should not be used. Um, and I'll leave it there. Thank you. Thank you very much for this presentation and uh, special thanks also for the loud and traveling voice, which I think help, helped with a little bit of the background noise. Um, so you won't be listening to me much more. I'd like to pass the floor to my colleague, Dong Jung, who's going to be moderating the Q&A session. And I encourage all of you to ask all the questions you've been wondering about for the past hours. So please, over to you. Um, first of all, thank you very much, all the uh, panelists. It was quite uh, fantastic. I just made a lot of notes. So just to sum up before we open the uh, floor to the questions, uh, there are a lot of really um, good points that we would like to come back and discuss further. Um, definitely, Jorgen uh, described all the uh, technological readiness level of the, uh, this particular technology, laser and microwave. Uh, and then Lauren just explained a lot of uh, points, reliability, distinction aspect, environmental condition, unintended consequences, and so on. And then also Stuart mentioned some of the really uh, specific example, active denial system, which is really worthy uh, considering together. And also lack of clarity and then more objective standards will be needed. So on given that, I will really open the discussion of the floor uh, for yours. Just uh, please, um, if you have any comments or questions, please feel free to raise your hands and share your name and affiliation. That will be really grateful. And we will be really keen to see some questions online as well. Please. Yes. Thanks very much for the really interesting presentations. I'm Daniel Lee from the United Kingdom delegation. Um, this is an area that's incredibly new to me, uh, and so kind of a couple of maybe basic technical questions came up during the course of those, those last two presentations. Um, I suppose uh, interested to, to know um, in terms of the mitigations and the risks and, and, and the, the penultimate presentation you were talking about, obviously you calibrate um, the target, particularly when it comes from uh, airborne sources. Um, and that, that, that obviously, if anything gets in the way of that, then that, that, that can obviously interfere with um, how much energy is then directed. But what, happen, what happens if you end up going through the target? Is there, how much does it depend on the energy that's obviously looking to be transferred? That would, or would the, the target that's hit absorb all of the energy that's there if, if there is, a, I guess, a physical service in the way? Or could targets, uh, or indirect targets behind the intended target also be hit by any of these weapons? Um, and I guess a broad question, I suppose, about the scope. Another area that um, has only started to come into my mind uh, over the last few weeks is the Torture-Free Trade Treaty. I'm talking about, obviously, use of some of these weapons in, a, I guess, a non-military context. And just wondering if that has been a subject that's kind of come across um, that work that's going on in, in, in different spheres as well, and if you have anything to say on that. Thanks. Please. Uh, well, my understanding, thank you for the, for the question, my understanding in relation to the, the first issue, um, and, and Jürgen, please correct me if, I, if I'm misstating, but um, I've been in discussion with a designer of a counter UAS laser and asked him the exact same question to say, well, what happens when the laser punches through its target? What happens What happens then? The point is the laser itself is, is a consistent energy beam that's being pumped out effectively from one end. So if it destroys the target and is left on, it continues past it. So it means that whatever it might hit beyond that point would have the same effect because it's it's an ongoing, um, it's effectively like firing lots of bullets at once. So in, in that context, the issue is really then how far is it calibrated to go before it gets impacted by things like blooming or the, the point is so far away that the energy can't be focused sufficiently to have that effect. From a from a heating perspective, so that's my understanding in relation to the first. Sorry, could you just repeat the second part of your your second question? I guess it's just where else uh, are these kind of weapons being discussed? So uh, we're obviously very much focused on a military context here, but we were talking a little bit in, in the last presentation about use from a right control perspective and police perspective as well. And I'm just wondering if if therefore these weapons are being included uh, in discussions 
that are that are focused on those as well, where there whether international negotiations potentially starting in the future. My understanding from a general export control perspective is a lot of the componentry for these weapons are captured under many domestic export control regimes, um, but they're not necessarily um, contained in the general multilateral tools. So I'd probably stick across the street and talk about the, um, the police and the. the Sure, thanks very much. Uh, it's actually a very important question that, that you've put. First thing to say is um, directed energy weapons do not fall under the scope of the arms trade treaty. Um, because, as you know, uh, they sort of partially included small arms and light weapons, but then they're deferred to UN instruments. The main instrument would be the international tracing instrument. And there has to be a projectile or a shot that's fired out of the weapon, which clearly isn't the case here. So my understanding would be that directed energy weapons would not be covered under the ATT. Now, there is um, an ongoing, uh, and it's early days, and we very much hope the United Kingdom will support it, a torture-free trade initiative that's looking at that issue outside of armed um, conflict, but use in, um, uh, in law enforcement. And there are certain weapons, and I've given the example of the uh, ADS and uh, the Silent Guardian. I think these are weapons that are very clearly should not be uh, used for law enforcement. Indeed, the UN, um, human rights guidance on less lethal uh, equipment says specifically that these weapons should not be used ever in law enforcement for the reasons that we understand. Thank you so much. Jurgen, do you have any additional comments on the first, in particular first questions? Okay, uh, just uh, on the propagation issue. Uh, these laser beams are not very narrowly focused. They rather open with a certain angle. So a cone is being illuminated and usually uh, the diameter of the beam at target range, for instance, if one uh, targets uh, a UAV is bigger than the target itself. So part of the energy in that beam will be caught and absorbed and heat up the target object but, may, but uh, another part, depending on the portion of the beam that is being covered by the target, uh, continues more or less freely and can hit something at a much greater distance. However, at a much greater distance, uh, this cone or the, the beam will have been widened much more. And as uh, Lauren has said, there may also be another effect uh, with this thermal blooming. So the damage effectiveness at a uh, let's say twice the distance or uh, even more at five times the distance of the target will be much less and maybe even uh, not really relevant. Uh, that's the one thing. Uh, and uh, on the uh, law enforcement use, I for one am, am not yet aware of any idea uh, of actually using uh, the ADS or deriv derivatives, uh, the skin heating thing in law enforcement. However, there have been uh, certain tendencies in this direction. Uh, and maybe, uh, or it need not be the relatively big system uh, that uh, Stuart mentioned, the Silent Guardian, which still has an antenna of several tens of centimeters size. It could also be just a thing that is kind of set to the body and heats just a CD like CD size spot. And then before it really causes medical burns, you stop it and do it somewhere else. So it, in principle, it would be a tool for applying torture at some prisoner uh, without actually leaving medically provable traces afterwards. But I think at the moment, this is just a principal possibility, and I'm very much in favor of the idea of uh, stopping these developments or these concepts from the beginning. Thank you very much. Actually, in the military domain, uh, most of the militaries around the globe thinking about some layered defense, so we must be kind of beyond the we intended some of the specific technology or weapon system, definitely it is related to the Lauren's point about some collateral harms and proportionalities in this respect. And thank you so much uh, for all. The other questions may be from online. 
everybody. Thank you for uh, <clears throat> being here. My name is Olivia Flash. I'm a consultant with the CCW Implementation Support Unit. We've got quite a few questions from our participants online. Um, this is a question from uh, Izatu Sar. Sorry if I pronounced your name wrong. Uh, it's directed at um, Dr. Altman, but I think it's actually broad enough for all our panelists. So perhaps we can hear from all, our, all of you on this one. Um, the prohibition on weapons causing unnecessary suffering and superfluous injury is a long-standing humanitarian rule, which is applicable in both international and non-international armed conflicts. What actions could policymakers take to ensure there is appropriate guidance for using directed energy weapons as the technology matures? Uh, do you want me to respond? Sure. Why don't you respond as the question yeah. was directed at you? And then, yeah. uh, well, it's it's not really a technical question, but uh, I think the directions uh, of Lauren, uh, uh, what, what she said is good uh, in this in this direction. Uh, and also what uh, uh, Stuart said, more clarity and how the is superfluous in injury is being or unnecessary suffering is being defined and how these categories are being applied in these cases. Uh, I, I, I think uh, much uh, some more research in the details of how this could go uh, in the, into the political realm is uh, is needed, but uh, that's what what I can say at the moment. Thanks. Yeah, just to add to, to what um, uh, Jürgen was saying, I, I do think, as I mentioned uh, in my re remarks, that there is a lack of clarity on the criteria for assessing when a weapon is uh, within or uh, in particular when it's breaching the superfluous injury rule. Uh, as I said, the Cyrus project, unfortunately, uh, was ended. Um, either the ICRC states, um, experts could get together and start to work on this again, because I do think we need some clear uh, criteria or clearer criteria than we have at the moment. The protocol four to the CCW um, was a major, major success. Remember, we prevented um, mass blindness potentially on the on the battlefield as a result of this preventive uh, law of armed conflict uh, instrument. If similar technologies or uh, related uh, technologies come on the market, we need to be sure that we would um, prohibit them before they get into widespread. Uh, use. Back in 1994-95, uh, uh, the first portable blinding laser ref, uh, rifle was being marketed on the international uh, market and international uh, weapons market, and uh, at least one other major military power had one uh, ready to go. So it was quite a close run thing, and uh, we really don't want to risk it uh, again, I would suggest. Thank you. Thanks. I, I might just offer, I'm probably more of the, the camp from the the chair's comments this morning that um, two plus two is three when it comes to regulation of some of these novel technologies. I think that states have very much identified the clear benefit of use of directed energy weapons and lasers in particular to deal with the challenges that are being posed by other novel technologies and hypersonics in particular. But I do think that there is um, potential to focus on prohibitions in relation to anti-personnel use of these kinds of weapons. I, I think that states have identified and are developing, have gone and invested significant money in terms of anti-material uses and identified clear benefits for that. Um, but I think that as far as anti-personnel use and incidental um, harm and the issue of superfluous injury, um, there is there is likely to be, or there is potential for there to be greater success in terms of trying to regulate that kind of use of these kinds of um, Thank you very much. And then, uh, yes. Yeah. Thanks a lot. Neil Davidson from ICRC. I just had a quick question about implementation of um, the Protocol 4, because you know one of the things that's not talked about much is the obligation to take feasible precautions in the use of non-prohibited uh, lasers. And I wondered, just a question to all panelists, whether in your view, based on current developments in laser weapons, um, thought you think any that issue deserves more attention in terms of uh, feasible precautions on non-prohibited lasers uh, anti-material lasers uh, and or are you aware of any information about existing precautions that are taken in practice um 
I think as, as far as feasible precautions is concerned, there hasn't been a lot of discussion in the literature or in the strategic documents from states who are talking about using these weapons. Um, as far as it being just a general principle as to application by states, obviously that's a that's a separate issue. Um, as far as how those precautions are being implemented when those weapons are being used, I would assume that it's being addressed through states looking at the intended and anticipated uses of those weapon systems going through weapons review processes, for example. Um, but I haven't seen any specific reference to um, mitigation of effects um, through, through feasible precautions in the strategic documents. That's not to say states aren't doing it though in, as part of their research and development because most of the publicly available information about these weapons and their design and development phases are very strategically focused and talking about things like, we would like to have an anti-tank laser, which doesn't really go into the specific details about those issues. Yeah, thanks, Sunil. I think that's an important uh, point. I was struck uh, when reading the US Department of Defense Law of War manual that blinding lasers get a sentence in a thousand pages and certainly no mention of the issue of physical precautions. So I think you're right, it hasn't been um, a primary concern, at least uh, as you say, there may be stuff going on behind the scenes, but certainly it's not out there on paper. And, and that I think is, is uh, a little bit concerning. Uh, I'd like to add a little about this one uh, ship-based laser weapon that I showed in the US. Uh, it would be used on the high seas uh, so that the possibility of hitting something behind a target a missile that comes uh, on, to, on the ship is not very big. Uh, however, if it's against a high flying aircraft and one shoots the laser pulse or the laser beam rather into the air, there might be the chance of some uh, civilian traffic uh, air traffic airliner uh, being hit uh, two kilometers above or maybe eight kilometers above. So uh, there is a slight but uh, not negligible chance of uh, such an event. And uh, I'm not aware of uh, any discussion or consideration uh, that uh, what is behind an intended target needs to be surveyed uh, for potential civilian uh, objects or, or personnel. So yes, uh, it would, would, be, would be good to do some more consideration in this area. Or any other questions from the floor? Um, thanks very much for the excellent presentations, uh, Ryan Lieber with the University of Queensland. Uh, thank you, Stuart, for your close examination of the superfluous injury rule. I agree that it's important to do that. It seems that some of the examples of the weapons that you gave or their uses, um, it, the weapons wouldn't be intended or of a nature to cause superfluous injury, but there is a foreseeable risk that they might be used in a manner that does cause uh, such injury or suffering. So do you think that the superfluous injury rule operates in a way to prohibit um, uses of lawful weapons uh, that cause superfluous injury? So do, does it extend to the use or is it a rule that is only limited to the weapon itself? Thank you. Um, very good question. It, it certainly covers the use. The, the question is, um, and I, I mentioned it obliquely in, in my presentation, whether you understand the rule as being of a nature to or calculated to. And the argument that uh, Baxter made back in the 70s was, well, you can't consider every remote potentially foreseeable use of any weapon. We just, you just can't do that. Well, no, maybe not. But I think, you know, we're not suggesting that you should check whether somebody's going to take a missile and bludgeon somebody to get death with it. That would be remote and, and pretty ridiculous. But when you have certain weapons like uh, this, where you can understand that there will be problems because you don't switch the energy off uh, quickly enough. I think it's not enough just to say, well, this is what we want to use it for. We're not going to look at any other potential uses. Um, but it would be nice if we could agree that as a, an international community. I, I think we certainly see from state practice where it is published that the focus is only on the anticipated use of weapons rather than potential uses. And I think that Stuart's mentioned that there are expected significant issues caused by uses that are all outside a very narrow band of defined 
something that probably could be considered in a forum, more like the CCW does to try and resist inclement weather. Because so that concern about the potential of harm for superfluous injuries from incidental effects from these weapons, for example, could be addressed in that kind of a forum rather than necessarily trying to resist injuries. And one more thing, just 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 to follow up on that, if we go right back to the St. Petersburg Declaration, as you know, the exploding bullets, they weren't aimed for personnel. They were aimed for ammunition wagons. That's what they were developed for. But very quickly, we understood, well, if you can fire it at wagons, you can also fire it at people. And it would have been absurd to have just focused on that use against ammunition wagons and then uh, not to consider the potential uh, personnel effects. Jordan, do you have any additional comments on this? Uh, not at the moment, no, thank you. Thank you so much. Yes, we've got quite a lot of questions from our online audience here. So perhaps what I'll do is um, I'll read out another two questions and then we've got two online participants who are hoping to ask their questions directly. So um, here's a question from Richard Asare. Uh, or a ser, uh, my apologies. Uh, he would like he would like to know uh, the possibility of um, directed energy weapons being applied to the nuclear or atomic areas and how this could be regulated. And then I'll go ahead and read this uh, another question here as well, which is quite interesting. Um, is there a possibility of residues that may linger on the environment and contaminate the water as well as contribute to climate change? And how does this impact uh, global warming? Let's uh, maybe take those two, uh, and then I'll continue with the online participants. Okay, um, since these are more or less technical, uh, I take the lead here. Uh, concerning the nuclear area, that's a fairly <laughs> general, general question. Um, I have already mentioned that directed energy weapons with long range being conceived of for ballistic missile defense, that is against nuclear missiles or rather nuclear re-entry vehicles traveling through space, uh, they would indirectly cover the issue of strategic nuclear weapons. So there is a, a connection here, but there's no question of doing something like igniting a nuclear weapon with a laser weapon or whatever might be uh, thought of. Uh, regulating, well, uh, I think there should be a, a reinstallment of such a thing, such as the Anti-Ballistic Missile Treaty, uh, which unfortunately had been abrogated by the US 20 years ago. Uh, the, there is rather a destabilizing general effect of ballistic missile defense. Uh, so uh, the regulation should rather work not at the directed energy weapon technology, but rather functionally at the general idea of defending uh, and against nuclear missiles. Uh, concerning residues harming, potentially harming the environment, I'd say uh, the electric lasers, uh, they are used by generators, maybe on a ship driven by diesel engines. So that's just a small part of what is being released by the big ship engines anyway to the atmosphere or to the sea. Uh, however, some of the chemical lasers, they have, have partly toxic uh, residues, but uh, these chemical lasers, as I said, the big chemical lasers also thought of in the context of ballistic missile defense, these projects have been uh, abandoned. So there's no real danger here. Uh, and I don't see a direct connection with global warming uh, because the uh, energy uh, released or maybe the CO2 released from uh, directed energy weapons or their generating electricity plants would be kind of negligible uh, compared to all the other sources of uh, climate warming gases. Thank you, Jorgen. Thank you all. Um, so we have um, maybe 10 minutes more to have more discussion on this issue. So maybe on online. So 
right, in that case, we've got an online participant who would like to ask their question directly. So uh, Bayou Wisaksono, I'm just going to allow you to be a presenter so that you can speak. Please go ahead and unmute yourself. Okay, thank you. I'm Bayou Jacksono from St. Petersburg University. Uh, my question is uh, that in the current uh, state of directed energy uh, weapons developments, when it comes to an incident, how do the current technological limitations and the government's I mean, the governance limitations in the uh, in the global regimes impact the ability to trace the origins of a shot, for example, or or an exposures? What challenges does this pose in terms of uh, forensic investigations and ensuring the responsible use of uh, this type of weapons? Uh, I think that's all. Thank you. So, it just uh, just want to confirm the question was in relation to attribution and traceability in in terms of the use of these kinds of weapons. Is that is that right? Uh, yes, for forensic investigations, in case of sure. an incident. Well, I, I think um, one one point to note in relation to a lot of the directed energy lasers, in particular, is that they are visible to the naked eye. So it would require some observation of where it's come from in terms of responding, or, or I guess. Um, reverse engineering where that particular shot has come from, which is one of the tactical weaknesses of those kinds of weapons, is that once the weapon is fired, it gives away the position of where it's been fired from. Um, but I think um, Jürgen mentioned that there are a number of weapons that you can't identify where it's um, it's actually come from. So that certainly does present a, a forensic challenge and an attribution challenge. But I don't know, Jürgen, if you wanted to, to comment on that further. Uh, uh, yes, uh, the range of these systems is not that big, except in these kind of extraordinary cases of shooting through thousands of kilometers through outer space. But normally it's just short range. And when you are in the vicinity and can observe that a beam is going on, not every beam, by the way, is visible. Some are infrared, so uh, you might not see the source directly. But uh, usually it's very close and um, with reasonably effort, reasonable efforts, you might be able to find out uh, from which direction it came and then look in that direction and whether there's whatever, some tank or some aircraft or some installation there, uh, you might find it. Uh, so I think there's uh, the, the task here is not that difficult. It is different if it is about blinding of sensors on satellites uh, circling around the Earth. However, the time when that is usually the satellites at close uh, at, at low altitudes they have they are above a certain region of the earth just for a couple of minutes so if you are just above africa the, the beam that has hit your sensor cannot have come from south america or whatever so there is certain uncertainty here but on the other hand normally these satellites they have cameras etc and there will be a very bright spot <laughs> if the laser, if the sensor the camera sensor for instance is saturated at a certain spot so you will have some uh, possibilities to have some idea at least when the thing starts to radiate before the sensor is being completely destroyed to have some idea where it came from Thank you very much, and thank you all for participating in this event. I think uh, we already discussed a lot, but it's only beginning of the discussion on this particular topic. Um, as uh, all the uh, speakers mentioned, maybe we need more discussion on the uh, clarity of the uh, criteria and protocol for uh, Neil mentioned and some of the other um, proportionality aspects, and then uh, ODA and UNIDIR are organizing some more upcoming events on this particular topic. So please stay tuned and then I will look forward to meeting you and discussing you on the uh, uh, 30th November. We will have a organizing uh, an event on quantum as well. So we'll see you uh, hopefully. And then thank you very much for all participating online and thank you Morgan for your presentation. Thank you all. So um, thank you. Uh, it concludes this uh, event. Thank you. Goodbye. <laughs>